I'm just going to start out with a quick introduction. So our webinar today is a year in the life of the of a lesser yellow legs, identifying the threats to a declining shorebird. It will be presented by Laura McDuffie, who's with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, Laura is traveling today, so unfortunately she could not give the presentation live, but uh, thankfully she did record it and um, we will be able to um, show it to you. And then we have several panelists on hand. Uh, Jim Johnson from the Fish and Wildlife Service, who's a collaborator on this project, uh, will be available as a panelist for questions and answers. We also have Anthony Levesque, who's a shorebird biologist in Guadeloupe, longtime member of Birds Caribbean. And we have Alex Sansom, who's our, our interim water bird program manager here at Birds Caribbean. So um, it's a very exciting webinar. We'll be getting started with that in just a minute. Hi everyone, thanks again for joining this webinar. Uh, again, my name is Laura McDuffie and I'm a wildlife biologist based out of Anchorage, Alaska. Um, and I've been studying lesser yellow eggs for about six years. And so this project I'm gonna to describe today it's a pretty extensive project that involves many different state and federal agencies, as well as universities from across Alaska and Canada. So the lesser yellows is in the Scolopacidae family, which includes the sandpipers, the snipe, the turnstones, and the curlews. And so the scientific name Tringa flavipes means basically a wading bird with yellow feet. So tringa comes from the ancient Greek word trungus, which means a thrush-sized, thrush white-rumped, tail-bobbing wading bird, um, which was referred to by Aristotle. And then flavipes is broken down into the Latin flavus, meaning yellow, and piece, which means foot. And in the French language, um, this bird is actually called a petite chevalier, meaning small knight. So the lesser yellow eggs is considered a medium-sized shorebird and is actually less than half as tall as the average domestic chicken. But in terms of their weight, the average adult lesser yellow eggs weighs about 0.08 kilograms, which is equivalent to two decks of playing cards. Whereas the average um, adult chicken weighs as much as 16 regulation cricket balls, which means that the chicken weighs more than 32 times that of the lesser yellow egg. So the lesser yellows are habitat generalists during the breeding season, meaning that they can nest in a variety of different habitat types. Um, so for example, open wetlands, uh, woodlands, meadows, spruce bogs, and urbanized habitats. And they tend to nest on the ground, they do nest on the ground um, and tend to use uh, depressions in the ground. And so in a good example in Alaska, um, nests have been found in many different habitats, so from forests to wetlands to meadows and even urbanized habitats such as uh, power line clearings, as well as even in this picture here, um, a nest right here in an old recycling center field. And then again, lesser yellows are habitat generalists during the non-breeding period as well. And so some do remain on the coast, um, uh, hanging out on the beaches and mudflats, um, but others will go to estuaries or rivers, lakes, um, even flooded agricultural areas and rangelands. Um, but they spend the non-breeding period in the southern portion of North America, as well as Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. And this picture here is actually, uh, it shows a flooded pasture um, in February in Guatemala. So the Caribbean region is basically the seasonal home for over 150 migratory bird species that spend the non-breeding period um, in the region or those that migrate to other areas, say in South America. And so the Caribbean provides a vital resource for long distance migrants, which allows these birds to replenish fat reserves that were used during um, their multi-day nonstop flights from North America. So in terms of what these birds eat, um, pretty much regardless of location, most lesser yellow eggs forage on aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates, which include flies and snails and beetles and dragonflies. Um, occasionally you may see them in pursuit of small fish, but this is usually more common for their larger cousin, the greater yellow legs. Um, but when lesser yellow legs are foraging, they tend to move pretty quickly in pursuit of their prey. 
Um, so here's actually a video I'm going to play for you that was taken on the bridge uh, in Alaska. So those are all adults or juveniles in um, breeding plumage. So now that you understand some of the basics of the life history characteristics of the species, you may ask yourself, okay, that's cool and everything, but why should I really care about the lesser yellow legs? Well, it's because this seemingly numerous species actually has and continues to experience a very precipitous population decline. So nearly all shorebirds that breed in North America are experiencing population declines. But the lesser yellow legs in particular has experienced a steep population decline of between 63 to 70% just since the 1970s. And this um, data is based on North American shorebird surveys as well as road-based um, North American breeding bird surveys. And so decades ago, the population was estimated at over 1.1 million birds. But with that decline, today we see an estimate of around 660,000 individuals. However, this precipitous decline really suggests that the estimate should likely be revised downward to a more probable global estimate of about 400,000 individuals. Now you think, may think this, this sounds like a large number, but um, if you think about the current population of people just living in the Caribbean islands, that's um, almost 44 million people. So 400,000 for one population of birds is pretty small. So there's this database called the Avian Conservation Assessment Database or ACAD, and it was established by Partners in Flight and it provides a conservation assessment and ranking for all of North American bird species and those that breed in North America. So a species is ranked following these different um, conservation metrics within this prioritization metrics uh, matrix. So the vulnerability, that means that the species is on a watch list. Um, in particular for the yellow legs, it's considered um, high vulnerability because it is on a watch list. Decline um, is the species in steep decline, meaning that the population is declined by greater than 50%. Yes, this is the case of the yellow legs, the lesser yellow legs. And then urgency, this can be thought of as kind of like half-life. So it's basically how long into the future it will take a population to lose an additional 50% of, of its population. And again, this is a uh, very um, high for the lesser yellow legs. And so this urgency metric is pretty startling. And for the lesser yellow legs, it predicts that the species will be reduced in size by an additional 58% within just the next 11 years. And so because of how the lesser yellow eggs is ranked in this prioritization matrix, um, it is considered a species of, of high concern, one that we need to try to um, conserve. So we know that the species is in decline, but we um, actually wanna know where geographically these bottlenecks are occurring. So if you are familiar with the term um, bottlenecks, uh, it's basically, so a population bottleneck or a genetic bottleneck is a sharp reduction in size of a population due to the environmental events such as uh, famines, earthquakes, floods, fires, disease, and droughts, as well as even human activities. So the, I'm going to give you some examples of um, potential uh, bottlenecks or threats for the lesser yellow legs. So the first one, climate change is causing permafrost thawing, um, which results in wetland drying in Alaska. So we all know that, of course, um, lesser yellow eggs rely on these wetlands for foraging. So that can then be considered a threat if these wetlands are drying up. Um, the next is the potential leaching of pesticides and chemicals into ponds and agricultural regions where the lesser yellow eggs are foraging during migratory stopovers. Um, so this is considered um, maybe within the prairie pothole region of Canada and um, North America. Uh, the next is potentially increased infrastructure on the Atlantic coastline of the United States, um, as well as Atlantic Canada. And um, 
An example of this would be maybe uh, building of new neighborhoods, thus reducing habitat. So that could be a potential threat. Um, rangeland intensification resulting in harmful algal blooms produced from sewage and cattle manure runoff uh, in the pompous regions of Argentina. That's another potential threat. And then lastly, um, at least that I'll describe here, is the unregulated harvest of lesser yellows for sport and subsistence hunting in the Caribbean and the Guianas region. So how would scientists actually determine where these bottlenecks may be occurring as well as those potential threats? Um, well, what we do is actually track these birds. So between 2018 and 2021, we tracked about 115 GPS uh, we've attached 115 GPS transmitters to uh, lesser yellow legs that were breeding in Alaska and Canada. And so we tracked their movements from their breeding sites to their non-breeding locations and back again. And so this is an example here of the antenna uh, of this GPS tag. And so the study included birds tracked from seven different geographically disparate breeding and post-breeding populations. Um, so we have Anchorage, Kennedy National Wildlife Refuge, and Isleson Air Force Base that were all in Alaska. There's Yellowknife Northwest Territories, Churchill, Manitoba, James Bay, um, Ontario, and Mingan, Quebec. So the Anchorage, Kennedy, Isleson, Yellowknife, and Churchill populations were all considered breeding populations, whereas the James Bay and Mingan are actually considered post-breeding populations because they are located within the species migratory range rather than their breeding range. And um, the value of these numbers next to each of these different locations actually indicates the total sample size, the total number of birds that we attach GPS tags to um, during 2018 through 2021. So in total, we tracked again, 115 individuals, 59 of which were females, 50 were males, and six were an unknown sex. So the first component of field work um, on the breeding grounds, as well as the first step in trying to reach our objective of tracking these birds and understanding um, about their, their migratory movements, um, was to actually monitor nests and find nests. So this actually helped scientists locate different breeding pairs which then we could capture later in the season. So nest searching um, evolved a lot of time. Uh, sometimes we got really lucky and it only took a couple minutes. I think the quickest one I found was about, took about five minutes to find, but usually they take many, many, many consecutive hours. Um, in some cases it would take a total of two days of, of searching to try to find a nest. So they can be pretty, excuse me, pretty tricky. Um, but once a nest is found, we, we monitored each, each of these nests with cameras as well as temperature loggers. And that was kind of a way for us to determine incubation rates, hatch dates, and overall nest fate um, without us having, actually having to visit the nest, say, every single day. And so in this photo here, this is actually an example of a temperature logger. You can barely see it, but it's sitting between the four eggs. Um, and it just basically collects the temperature every two minutes. And then this video here shows where a lesser yellow eggs actually um, was walking back into its nesting area to incubate. So you can see that um, it's pretty hidden. That's why these can be hard to find. So that bird went into incubate. So nest depredation by bears and other birds um, wasn't necessarily frequent, but we usually had several every year. Um, so if a nest was depredated, usually um, the pair would not re-nest, which resulted in a complete re reproductive loss for that particular pair. And then usually those um, pairs that were unsuccessful, those individuals would depart the breeding grounds earlier than those that had successful nests um, and have chicks. Um, so here's an example. Um, from one of our cameras last year. This is a cinnamon phase black bear that uh, consumed one of our nests. All right, so after nest searching, so once the lesser yellings actually have their chicks, their chicks are hatched, 
Um, these, the adults are very territorial and are responsive to their chicks making any sort of noise. So in order to track these birds again, remember we actually need to capture the adults to be able to put the GPS tags on them. So a method, a couple methods we used to do this was actually play the recording of a chick call on a speaker near a net, a mist net, and that would attract the adults towards the net and we'd be able to capture them. Um, so there were two common methods we used. We used the flip net method and the vertical mist net method. Um, so here are two videos. This is the flip net. We touch it that way and you can hear the chick call in the background. And then we get the bird out of the net. And then this is the, just a vertical net. And so then that is another method for catching these birds. And again, we get them out as quickly as we can to, to process them. So um, one thing to note about these methods, the using the chick calls, is that they really, it only worked about between zero to three days after hatch. And then the adults became less and less responsive to the point where they didn't even acknowledge the chick call anymore. So it was only a very small time period where we could actually um, capture birds with this method. All right, so then after capturing birds, each individual is banded with a USGS metal band, as well as a color band that corresponded to the study location and an engraved leg fat flag that had a unique um, letter combination. So we'd be able to tell uh, individuals apart. We also collected basic measurements, um, such as tarsus length, which is in this picture shown here. This is tarsus. Um, we also collected measurements on bill length, uh, wing length, body mass. Um, we also collected different biological samples. So for example, we collected blood samples um, to look at genetics and that way we could determine sex of these birds because it's really difficult to determine if a bird is male or female just by having it in the hand. And then finally, before we released each bird, we uh, attached the GPS tag using one millimeter stretchy jewelry cord as a harness. And so we use this leg loop method. So you can kind of think of it as the shape of a butterfly. So the body of the butterfly would be the GPS tag. The wings would be these, these leg loops, this uh, stretchy jewelry cord. And so the, the loops go around the bird's legs and then the, the tag fits snugly, just sits right on the back of the lesser yellings, as you can see in this picture, just like it's wearing a backpack. So then finally, we would release each bird so that scientists could actually track their movements and, like I mentioned previously, identify the potential bottlenecks and threats that the birds experience throughout the entire year. So here's another video of birds carrying this GPS. And you may find it kind of funny that these birds are actually standing on the tops of trees, but that is very common where they breed in North America. All right, so now I'm gonna switch gears and dive in a little bit deeper into the really extraordinary movements that lesser yellow legs um, undertake. And I'm gonna describe uh, what these GPS tags are actually telling us about the species that's in peril. Um, so here's just a, a short animation that shows the overall tracks of um, all 115 individuals um, throughout the mating cycle. So you can see that there's a lot of variation in where these birds are spending the winter time. All right, so I'm gonna actually describe the movements of three different individuals. So this first one is PE, and PE was banded in Canudi National Wildlife Refuge in interior Alaska. 
And he is a male and weighed about 79 grams when we first captured him. And in a full year, he traveled uh, 19,865 kilometers. So he departed the Canadian National Wildlife Refuge on July 3rd of 2019, and then arrived in Forestburg, Alberta on the 21st of July and stayed there through the 14th of August, so for about four weeks. And then in just four days, uh, he completed a flight and arrived in Cypress Quarters, Florida, before he actually crossed the Caribbean on September 1st, where on the 11th of September, he actually arrived at the non-breeding location um, in Ecuador and remained there through April 14th. So that was a total of uh, eight months in Ecuador. And then on during spring migration, heading back north, he stopped for about five days in Dean, Iowa, before arriving back at Canudi by May 15th. So auto migration took about three months for this bird, while spring migration only took about one month. So some of the potential threats um, that this bird may have faced during migration. Um, in Alberta, there's agriculture, coal mining, oil and gas production. In Florida, there's agriculture as well as uh, urbanization, Ecuador, uh, agriculture, and again in Iowa, agriculture. So um, there's, he uses quite a variety of different habitats. Um, but he may have been potentially exposed to different threats such as habitat alteration as well as agrochemical exposure. All right, so now I want you to meet Churchill bird A65. So again, he was a male, he weighed 82.9 grams, and this bird traveled a whopping 26,251 kilometers in a single year. So he departed Churchill, Manitoba on July 29th of 2019. And he moved a really short distance relative to the rest of his migration um, to an area in central Manitoba where he stayed there through about August 18th. And then next he moved really quickly and completed a transoceanic flight across the Atlantic and arrived in Venezuela on August 26th of, of 2019. Um, after that, he actually stopped along the Amazon River in Brazil for about a month before he finally arrived at his non-breeding location down in Argentina and was there from about October 15th all the way through May 3rd before he decided to migrate north once again. And so on the way back, um, he took um, very, very short stops. Um, the longest one was actually in Bolivia, which is only five days. And then he flew very quickly back to uh, Churchill and arrived there by May 31st of 2020. And so again, autumn migration lasted about three months for this individual, where spring migration was about one month. So again, some potential threats um, in these different areas. Ranching um, was the most common one, but um, there are definitely many potential threats that this individ individual encountered, um, which include, included habitat alteration as well as toxicity or algal blooms. Um, but he also seemed to take advantage of some of these floodplains in South America, um, where there aren't necessarily a lot of different human activities going on in those areas. All right, lastly, I want you to meet JP. So JP, again, is a male. Um, he was banded in Anchorage, Alaska and weighed 80.5 80 grams and traveled a distance of 10,576 uh, kilometers. But as you can see here, we didn't actually have a return trip. So this bird departed Anchorage on July 2nd of 2018 and arrived in Viking, Alberta on July 14th and stayed there through about the 19th before moving on to Manitoba and North Dakota. Um, and where he stayed in that prairie pothole region through about September 1st. Next, he flew all the way across the country and then completed a multi-day transoceanic flight um, across the Atlantic before arriving in Barbuda on September 7th. And he actually remained there for one full month. So he departed Barbuda on October 7th. So then J B J JP continued on to Guyana and Suriname, um, and that is where the tag actually went offline on February 22nd. 
So it's really not uncommon to have incomplete track lines. Um, and when, when that happens, the fate of those birds um, and the reason that the transmitter stopped really is inconclusive. So for someone that may want to come, someone may want to come to the conclusion that this bird went to Suriname, so it was likely harvested and that's why it went offline. But we cannot say that. So maybe the GPS battery failed um, or maybe the harness fell off and the tag was covered in mud and couldn't transmit anymore. So we just can't say what exactly happened just based on that the tag no longer is working. So again, some of the potential threats that this bird encountered um, throughout, throughout migration um, is exposed to likely habitat alteration, different areas, as well as agrochemical exposure, and then uh, unregulated harvest. Um, and then if you look in central Barbuda, where this bird spent that month, um, ecotourism. So that's not really considered a threat per se, but um, if managed correctly, it actually can be pretty beneficial to the species as it's really a way to educate the public about different bird species. All right, so back to the objectives. So we really wanted to identify where these bottlenecks were occurring and potential threats. Well, that's definitely a lot easier said than done. But once you actually look beyond just single individuals and consider the entire population, then the patterns really uh, tend to emerge. So the first step was to explore different common regions. And so we saw the prairie potholes, many birds went through there, central Argentina, many birds went there. And then again, the Caribbean and Guianas, many birds went there. Um, so uh, we really want to try to explore these different areas in different ways. So the prairie potholes um, this year, 2021, was actually a pilot year um, to try to identify if pesticide exposure of lesser yellings is considered a real threat. So there's a new graduate student that went down there in July for a couple weeks and captured birds and collected blood samples. So we'll have um, results hopefully in a couple of years. Um, and then central Argentina, um, there are some Argentine and Chilean collaborators down there that are conducting different lesser yellig surveys um, during the wintering or non-breeding period. Um, so they really want to try to compare abundance of the, the species across years, as well as try to recite some of the birds that we banded um, on their breeding grounds. And then lastly, in the Caribbean and the Guianas, um, the goal is really to try to calculate the potential occurrence of lesser yellings within different countries and jurisdictions that participate in unregulated harvest. And this was the focus, or one of the main focuses of my master's thesis that I just recently completed. So I'm gonna actually describe that um, study a little bit more in depth. So again, the objectives, so identifying threats on regulated harvest. So as I mentioned, the main topic of my thesis was to try to understand harvest exposure of these different geographically disparate or separate breeding populations. So the harvest of lesser yellings most commonly occurs in the Caribbean, the Guianas, which of course is Guyana, Suriname, and French Guiana, um, as well as the northern states of Brazil along the coast. And so this is clearly indicated by the Atlantic Flyway Shorebird Initiative Harvest Working Group. All right, so those are um, in red some of the sites or the primary um, exposure zones that I'm looking at. So here's a table of estimated annual harvest values for shorebirds, as well as lesser yellings for several Caribbean as well as South American jurisdictions. So it's really important to note that the majority of harvest actually occurs during autumn. So this would be July through October. And so the far right column, this column here, indicates the percent of lesser yellings that are harvested within the total shorebird harvest estimate per jurisdiction. And so the confidence score here, the higher low, indicates the degree of confidence in those actual estimates. So estimating annual harvest is based on um, either hunter surveys um, and, and reporting or um, looking at or completing uh, hunter log books. So in areas where hunting is illegal or even in some areas where it is legal, it actually can be really difficult to get a sense of take because participation in surveys is so low at this, at this time at least. And so 
even so, based on these values, it's really clear that harvest does occur at some degree. Um, and it's really important to try to understand whether birds from certain breeding populations are disproportionately exposed to shorebird harvest. So here's a figure actually out of my thesis. So it shows the proportion of birds from each breeding and post-breeding population that occurred um, within an exposure zone. And IELTSN was actually added in 2000, or 2021, this past year. So um, it's not included in this, in this figure. Um, but you, if you move from basically from left to right, so uh, west to east, Anchorage, Canudi, Yellowknife, Churchill, James Bay, and Mangan. So the majority of um, harvest occurs in autumn. And um, so I actually used a cutoff value of October 21st for this data set. So this is only looking at data from when a bird began migrating from the breeding site to October 21st. And this is also because the locations, um, the actual GPS locations that we were receiving were transmitted less frequently after October 21st. And this was a way for us to try to save some battery life on these tags so that we could um, collect data during the spring migration and winter period as well, or non-breeding period. And so what the results showed is that birds that are tracked, of the birds that were tracked, the birds originating in Eastern Canada had the highest proportion of exposure However, even birds that originated far west, such as Anchorage, did see a small portion of individuals enter one or more of those zones. So if you think back from a couple minutes ago, um, I talked about JP. JP was um, an Anchorage breeder who actually um, flew all the way to Suriname. So then this figure, again, out of my thesis, uh, shows the probability of a randomly selected individual from each population occurring in any harvest exposure zone or outside of a zone. So this is exclusively a binomial model with random effective individual. And so what we found is actually the James Bay and Mingan population, which I combined due to a small sample size, it had the highest probability of occurrence from about mid-August through October, Whereas the Anchorage and Canudi population, again combined because of small sample size, um, had the lowest probability during that same time period. So it's basically flatlined here down at the bottom. Um, it was also interesting to look at the different temporal differences in peak occurrence. Um, so Churchill, the peak was um, about mid August, whereas for James Bay and Mingan, it was more um, close to the end of August or early September. And it was actually really, it's really important to try to understand the different timing within each of these zones um, because not all harvest occurs at the same time. There are some open and closed seasons in some jurisdictions. Um, so the risk of harvest really can fluctuate over time. Um, a good example of this is actually in Barbados where the open season runs from the 15th of July to the 15th of October. So say if a bird was present at that time, its risk would, I would say, is likely higher than, say, if the bird was there in February. All right, and so this figure here shows the probability of a randomly selected individual from each population occurring in each exposure zone. And so this is a series of binomial models. And what the results showed is that the Anchorage, Canudi, and Yellowknife population um, occurred in the Caribbean Guyan and Guyanas whereas the Churchill population could be found in all three of the exposure zones, Caribbean, Guyana, and Brazil, um, whereas uh, the James Bay Mangan was only found in the Guianas in Brazil. So again, the timing and probable exposure differs among these different populations, and so it really depends on um, when and where um, they are located uh, within these potential exposure zones. All right, so harvest isn't only a predicted threat, but it's actually it was an observed threat as well. So fortunately, because of some strong collaborations with biologists working in the Caribbean, we actually were able to receive some shorebird harvest reports. So in fall of 2020, we received information about two of our tagged lesser yellow eggs that had been harvested um, in that fall. And so 02A was banded in Yellowknife in 2019 and was harvested in Guadeloupe on August 15th of 2020. 
Um, and then A65, if you remember that bird, we actually, it was one of the examples I gave. It was banded in 2019, completed a full migratory route, and then was harvested in Martinique on September 4th of 2020. Um, so here again is that route of A65. So it flew from Churchill to Argentina and back in that single year. But then the following year, it was harvested. So both birds um, actually completed a full annual migratory cycle prior to being harvested. But the really interesting thing is that neither of these birds were actually detected within the Caribbean during 2019, where of course you all know Guadeloupe and Martinique are, are both located. So this really suggests that there may be variation in pathways even between years um, for the same, same individual. Um, so they could, they could be influenced by weather, maybe food resources, who knows. Um, but I really would like to mention and just say thank you. Thank you to the hunters and the managers who actually provide harvest information to those that are conducting the research on the species like me. So we really try to under, we really understand that harvesting of lesser yellows is a cultural practice and in some cases a, is a means of income. Um, but the information provided by hunters, as well as hunting clubs and associations, even law enforcement and the general public, is really critical for the proper management of the species. Because when a population is well managed, it actually ensures that the bird will be around for future generations to harvest. Whereas a poorly managed population could potentially lead to a species extinction. Um, a couple examples, um, we've seen this with the passenger pigeon and the Eskimo curlew. So the both the pigeons and the curlews, um, once numbered in the many, many millions, but with hunting and as well as habitat alteration, it really led to their demise. So although um, the Eskimo curlew um, is considered extinct by many. Um, it hasn't been there hasn't been one seen in over 58 years. Even it's still considered um, endangered in classification. All right, so harvest of lesser yellows is a pretty recently understood threat um, because I have this um, research that I've recently done, and so our results show that the eastern population, which included James Bay, Churchill, and Mingan were most susceptible, are, are most susceptible, and may be disproportionately impacted by harvest if they aren't managed properly. So when we're thinking about sustainable harvest, the focus really shouldn't be on how many individuals are harvested annually, but whether the lesser yellow population is able to handle the mortality that it's endured as um, while it's still trying, while we're still trying to reach those management um, objectives. So there's this potential biological removal, um, also known as sustainable mortality limit. And that value defines the estimated mortality that the lesser yellows population can handle while remaining at a stable state. And so the current PBR value is set at 79,000 individuals, and that includes all sources of mortality. So we're not just talking about hunting here specifically. So that value of 79,000 was actually based on the continental population size of 660,000. Um, so harvest is just one of those sources of mortality, but the, the PBR near, nearly equals the average annual harvest estimate for less yellow legs, which is around 75,000 individuals. So that's, that's um, should put up a red flag right there. So if harvested birds are mostly from those Eastern origins, like I mentioned, it may be more appropriate to actually base that PBR value on the Eastern Canada population size rather than that continental population size. And in that case, the PBR would likely be reduced, but then we would be able to protect that, this, this species. So there are, um, in addition to harvest, many other threats that can also contribute or are contributing to um, this, the population decline. And so lesser yellows breeding in Anchorage, they don't always appear to occur within harvest exposure zones. Like I mentioned before, they have a low likelihood of occurring in those areas, but that population is actually still in decline. So that suggests that other threats may be the cause of the decline besides harvest, of course. So for example, the potential exposure of birds to pesticides while foraging in the prairie pothole region 
um, that may be a threat to them. We just have to, to wait and see and continue our research. All right, so a couple take home messages from this um, study. Globally, lesser yellows are in steep decline and um, there's likely only about 400,000 individuals remaining. And so also the cause of the decline is still includes knowledge gaps. We don't know everything, we don't know all the answers, but several threats have been identified. So research on the species has helped identify several different potential threats, but further collaborative studies are needed. And this really, we need assistance from local biologists, managers, hunters, and the public in the Caribbean and regions beyond. The proper management of a species it also ensures that it will be around for future generations. So um, the proper management of a species really ensures that it will be around for, for your kids and your grand grandkids to enjoy um, and utilize as well. And then lastly, awareness and education can go a long way. So awareness and education of the species decline and an understanding of potential threats really is important to understand. So when people are aware of something, they're even more likely to take action in one way or another, um, or even participate in some sort of scientific effort, such as submitting shorebird harvest records to uh, managers. That's always helpful. All right, so I just wanted to end with this slide here. Um, there is a lot more beyond just education. Um, there's also action. So in the United States, as well as beyond, um, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has really been promoting these seven simple actions that anyone can do to help try to conserve um, all bird species. So not just the lesser yellow legs, not just shorebirds, but all species. Um, so you may think that just one person can't really make a difference, but you really can. So here are the, the seven simple actions. Um, so the first, bird-friendly coffee, shade-grown coffee. You can um, consume that instead of, say, other products. Um, participate in citizen science programs. Um, participate in different surveys that can help, help scientists um, better understand population abundance or size. Um, here's a fun one. Um, try to prevent window strikes um, by putting up decals on your windows. Um, keeping your cats inside. And also um, using native plants in, in, land, in landscaping. That's always um, really important for many species. So I'm just gonna end by um, stating my various funding sources. Definitely cannot have done this without um, all the people I mentioned at the very beginning, different agencies. Um, it's definitely pretty costly to put tags on all these birds and but the data we collected it's just it's so useful it was all worth it in the long run um so yeah these are all of my collaborators and I just want to say thank you so much for listening today and feel free to to send me an email um, since I'm not actually present during the webinar um, but yes please feel free to send any questions you may have uh, thank you so much so um, th thanks again to Laura for that incredible talk, um, really fascinating research, and we wish she was here firsthand to um, answer your questions. And um, unfortunately, she's not, but we do have with us several people that are going to help out with the Q&A. So we have um, Jim Johnson, and um, Jim is from, uh, he joins us today from Anchorage, Alaska where he is a wildlife biologist and coordinator of the Boreal Bird Program for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And Jim has studied the breeding ecology and migratory movements of lesser yellowlegs since 2016. So welcome, Jim, and thank you for joining us. You. And we also have um, Anthony Levesque, who I think many of you know. He um, lives and works in Guadalupe. Uh, he is a longtime shorebird biologist and has been working on studying and monitoring and conserving and educating about shorebirds for many, many years in Guadalupe. Um, so thank you for joining us, Anthony. He works directly with hunters in the field, both in Guadalupe, Martinique, and, and um, has some very interesting news and updates to share with us during the discussion section. And we also have with us Dr. Alex Sansom. She is our Waterbird program manager, and she's based in Trinidad. She did her PhD research on red shanks, and is also doing some surveys in Trinidad as well as well as um, working with us and all of our partners 
on uh, shorebird monitoring and conservation and education projects. So thank you, Alex, for joining us. All right, so um, there are a few questions. I will um, close the question and, and we'll see um, who best can answer the question, provide the answer. Uh, Emma Lewis from Jamaica asks, how many yellow legs actually just crossed the Caribbean without stopping? And where are their, their most common stopping off points? Uh, Laura talked about this a little bit, but Jim, if you have it, or any of the panelists, if you have further insights or more details on that question. I can take a, a stab at that. Um, I think that a lot of birds are relying on the islands to stop and rest. And I think that's particularly the case when there might be weather systems that, that stop birds migrations temporarily. For example, you know, hurricane season in, in autumn is a known factor in fallouts on the Caribbean islands. And I assume that lesser yell legs are, are affected by that. Um, I, I, I certainly think that lesser yell legs could, could fly over the Caribbean uh, without stopping, but I think that it makes the most sense if there's available habitat for them to stop, rest, and refuel if they can. That's a good question. And you're right, Laura's, Laura's tracking data, if we, if we dove it into it in a little more detail, uh, we, could, we could provide more clear answers. Yeah, I'll follow up with Laura and um, try to get more details on that because, of course, we're very curious about each of the places where the birds stop so that we can um, publicize and share that. Anthony or Alex, do you have any further comments? Okay. Yeah, and Jim, your, your answer jogged my memory about what happened to um, Machi and Goshen in 2012. These were two wimbrels with satellite tags that were shot in Guadalupe. And that was right after, um, what was the name of the hurricane, Anthony, that year? They, um, they made it through. They flew through and survived a hurricane and they landed on Guadalupe to rest. And the minute they landed there, they, they got shot. So um, the birds do rely on the islands as a stopping over point, you know, especially after storms and so forth. All right, great. Um, Patty Coger had a question. She asked, where and when do they molt? Uh, on, on the non-breeding grounds, on the wintering areas. Um, so, you know, it's possible that, that some birds are, are molting from their alternate plumage into pre-basic plumage in the Caribbean, uh, assuming that they spend a long enough period of time there. You know, molt takes, it's, uh, it's protracted. It, it will take months to complete a full body molt and wing molt. And they likely complete it uh, in February and, and March in time to begin their northward migration. Yeah, we often see shorebirds and yellow legs molting into their breeding plumage by, by springtime, which is nice to see. Okay, and um, Janice Hetzel from Bermuda is asking, which agrochemicals are of greatest concern for shorebirds? Um, I, I'm not a, uh, an expert on this topic, but I, I understand that the neonicotinoids, which I think are one of the most commonly used pesticides throughout the Western hemisphere is, is, is one group of chemicals that is kind of become, becoming more of a concern. And the, the prairie pothole region uh, in particular uses huge quantities of neonicotinoids and we're hopeful that we can support a, a new project that looks, on, looks at that exact uh, topic of, of studying birds during uh, both Southbound and southbound and northbound migrations to look at the um, the potential for birds to uh, uptake those chemicals and as well as how those chemicals could potentially uh, affect prey abundance and availability. You know, they're like Laura mentioned in her presentation. These these birds focus on invertebrates, which are very likely affected by the use of of these pesticides that are in such common use. 
Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I think a lot more research is needed on that. And it's interesting to think about the impacts on the birds directly versus indirectly through the foods that they eat and what they're accumulating over time, you know, the, the chemicals in their body and their body fat over time and how that might be harmful. Certainly needs a lot more research. And these birds do, sometimes they spend a lot of time in agricultural fields, right? They're fond of flooded rice fields and so forth. So they could get a lot of exposure. Yeah, definitely. Um, prairie potholes, for example, um, I think uh, most of the birds that were captured at Western locations, uh, I think upwards of 80 to 90 percent of those individuals stopped and spent a considerable amount of time in the prairie potholes. And then that area in, in Southern South America that includes um, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Argentina, I think there's also a lot of agricultural happening. Ag agriculture happening there. I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the chemicals that are used in those southern locations, but um, very likely neonicotinoids and, and potentially even chemicals that, that aren't used uh, in the United States like DDT and those sort of relatives to DDT. Mm -hmm. Alex, do you have any observations from Trinidad about habitat use of yellow legs? Um, other than they have like a very strong preference for the kind of flooded rice fields here. So I guess like there is a high chance of them being exposed to those kinds of chemicals if they're being used. I don't know very much about what pesticides are used on the fields here, but I would assume they are used. So yeah, they would be exposed. It's the, they use all the different wetland habitats here in Trinidad, but we see like by far the highest numbers using the kind of flooded rice fields. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, another question. I'm not sure if Laura touched on this, but um, do we know how high the birds are flying when they migrate? Any idea? Uh, no, um, unfortunately, these GPS tags don't provide that information. Um, the larger tags have barometers on them and accelerometers so you can really like dive into their movements and um, these tags because we need them to be so light are limited in the information that they provide okay but i guess if you think about um you know the fact that these birds are are you know identifying places like um wetlands and coastal areas of uh, on the Caribbean islands, they, I, would, I would assume that they're relatively low altitude migrants and can kind of make decisions about what looks good and when to stop based on you know, what they're actually seeing. So um, that's my <laughs> uninformed guess is probably you know, a couple, couple thousand feet max. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, another question from Kevin, he's asking what factors make lesser yellow legs more susceptible than other shorebirds to hunting in the Caribbean? Anthony, you might have an idea about that. You know my English level, Lisa, can you repeat, please? <laughs> I'm sure, of course. Um, what factors make lesser yellow legs more susceptible than other shorebirds to hunting in the Caribbean? Why are they shot more than other birds? Why are they popular? Are they popular? Are they easier to shoot? Because, because it's the, the most abundant shorebird species in the marsh, simply. And um, if the, the, the godwit or, the, or, the, or the, the plovers were more abundant than the lesser yellow legs, of course, it would have been those species. So it's just because this is the most uh, common species, simply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? I, I have a question, Anthony. I've thought about that a lot too. And I, I wondered whether part of it might be just their behaviors and their responsiveness to, to calls. Don't, don't some of the hunters um, use decoys and what, as well as like whistling calls to attract birds? Uh, in, in Guadeloupe, they don't use decoys. In Martinique, they can use them. Uh, it's plastic decoys or uh, wood man-made decoys. But yes, uh, they are very easy to attract with the, how do you say, the whistle. They, they, they play the whistle. 
it could be with um made with a, a bone of a, what is it goat or sheep something like that especially in Barbados I think but um, also uh, you can you can buy uh, this kind of whistle in, in for the, the the special place for hunters and yeah they are very easy to attract and it's it's um, very impressive to see the difference between the the showbird behavior in in the Americas and in Europe compared to Europe here in Guadeloupe in the Caribbean they are very they are not shy at all compared to Europe where they are very shy and, and difficult to to approach in general so I would say that it's really really not difficult to hunt shorebirds in the Caribbean really okay yeah, you have been out in the field a lot, so you you see it happening all, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, and Mary Mural was asking, how low does the lesser yellow legs population need to get before hunting will be prohibited? I, I know that's the question that's, is for me. <laughs> yeah, it's a difficult question, and maybe maybe you can just say a little bit about what's happening with the hunting situation right now and the recent success in Martinique with prohibiting um, hunting yeah. of a few different shorebird species. Give us a little summary. Yeah, each, each year there is a, a meeting with the hunters, the administrations and the, the bird protection the NGOs. And um, it's uh, the law, the rules are different between Guadeloupe and Martinique. They are sister islands and they are both French, of course, but it's it's uh, how it is. It's different, but <clears throat> sorry. But um, in to be honest, in Guadeloupe, they made good efforts since um, the shot of Machi and Goshen. So the, now we have some day off without any hunt, and they set up some bag limits. Uh, we protected uh, some of uh, some species like the red knot, and um, and now the the rim world is. Um, uh, you cannot hunt these species anymore in Guadeloupe. But in Martinique, um, they probably don't understand the, the, the situation. And um, they try to set up some kind of bag, bag, uh, bag limit, but it was just like a joke. You know, it was so high, so it was not a, a problem at all uh, for the hunters. It was not, um, yeah. It's not. It was not a, a problem for them. It's, it was so high. So uh, we, uh, when I say we, it's uh, six NGOs, two two nationals, three from Guadeloupe and one from Martinique. We um, attacked or contested the order, the decree, and uh, for thirteen species. And um, we can say it was a, a big win because eight of them. Uh, as they can stop, they cannot shoot them, the species anymore, uh, up to the end of the hunting season, which is mid February in Martinique. So uh, they don't have the right to shoot the the godwit, the Hudsonian godwit, the two plovers, the American golden and the black bellied plover, the um, short billed dorwitchers, and that's it but uh, sadly not the lesser yellow legs so we have to work on on this issue again because in martinique they are not making any efforts to to um, to make a sustainable hunting so this is why we were in the obligation to attack the order so you probably know it's um, it's something not very pleasant because um, they are sometimes aggressive and uh, one of the last meetings la uh, lasts for five hours with very, you know, it was, how do you say, nasty. So it's not easy, but um, we think that um, showbirds needs our help and, um, and um, I take the opportunity uh, to, to thank everybody who sent some message after the, the call, um, uh, thanks to Birds Caribbean about the, the, the help we needed 
to say that we are against this uh, proposition, this decree. And um, even if it, it was not really effective at the beginning because the prefet decided to sign um, more in favor of the hunters, but uh, I'm sure it will, um, it will be very helpful for the next season. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thanks for all your hard work on that, Anthony. And yeah, we will continue to work with Anthony and, and do our best to work with the local hunters to, to make sure that the hunting laws are, are reasonable and enforced. And you know, if birds are threatened and declining, then there should most certainly be um, stricter bag limits. And um, right now, I think that um, the hunting estimates are probably on the low side, that they're higher than maybe what Laura presented, according to Anthony. So, um, you know, I yeah. think that especially because uh, we don't have any real numbers estimation uh, from Guadeloupe. We, it's just, you know, a roof estimation of, of what, what, what they are taking. But we also have to consider that um, many shorebirds are just uh, injured and are lost for the population also because they, they, they sometimes, not, not sometimes, very often in the March, I can find some, some dead birds or some injured with a broken legs or broken wings. So it's, it was like, it's like uh, if they are dead for the population. So yeah. it's really important. Yeah. So very likely the hunting estimates are, are low because there's all these birds that are injured that we don't know about. And, so forth. Um, all right, let's see what else we have. Uh, Scott Johnston is asking, what are the best ways to reach out to the local governments to manage hunting? How is the relationship working with the government? Um, because, you know, it's, it's, there is this meeting every year between the hunters and the, the administration, et cetera. And before signing the, the, the decree, there is a public consultation. I don't know if it's something that takes place, for example, in US or Canada or, else, or somewhere else in the Caribbean, but this is um, how it, um, it is uh, set up in, in, in France. So probably for the next um, hunting season, so it will be the next um, important meeting will take place uh, next May or June. Um, so this is probably the, the best time at this moment to, to send massive message to say that we are not agree with the proposition, but we can always uh, expecting uh, that uh, the hunters will have um, some better proposition, especially from Martinique. But you know, actually, it's it's now very difficult to discuss with them because we um, we contest the order, we attack the order. So now now it's like a, a fight. It's very difficult to to, to discuss. But um, it was an obligation. They don't want to to set up um, bag limits in Martinique. There is no day off. They are. Um, and in too many species, especially the declining species. So it was an obligation. And if they don't want to be um, cool with the bird, nice, and, and you know, take only a few of them. Okay, let's go to, to the, let's use the justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, certainly international pressure can help a lot, um, as we saw with Machi and Goshen. And, yeah. letter writing campaign and so forth, the petition, you know, all that helped the international yeah. attention. There is really a, 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 a big difference between Guadeloupe and Martinique. And it's um, it's certainly because Machi of Machi and Goshen uh, shot in, in 2012, if I'm not wrong. And um, uh, yeah, the, the shame is because Martinique didn't make anything very, you know, very interesting since um, since this problem. So Guadeloupe said, but look at the Martinique, they are not making anything. And Martinique say, well, pff, we don't care. Yeah. Yeah, well, congratulations to you and LPO and all the organizations that work to contest 
the the hunting laws and got those limits put in place. This just happened this last week. And um, I can look up the link to the press release and share it with you. It's in French, but of course you can translate it. So that was a big win, really yeah. big win. We repeat all the time that we are not against hunt, okay? All, all the NGOs are not against hunt, but we want sustainable hunting. We don't want that they shoot declining species or threatened species. And um, yeah, okay, it's um, it's a really a French tradition. Or it, also in Barbados, it's very important, cultural, etc. But um, we cannot continue like that. Or the next one after the Eskimo curl will be the lesser yellow leg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and it works best when you can when the hunters become your allies and cooperate with you and you work together. You know, if they can understand the biology of the bird and it's in their best interests to not have unlimited shooting opportunities, um, then hopefully they will get on board. I know it it will be very difficult. To be honest, it will be very difficult. But I still have some hope that if we are showing them that this species is, uh, in, is really in a big decline and uh, perhaps thanks to the, the, the video that we will spread around that, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I still hope that uh, things can change um, or at least in Guadeloupe not, you know, going like in, in the past because this is actually what they want to do. It's like hunting every day, no bags limit because in Martinique they are not doing everything. So we will need uh, the international pressure next year. But um, be sure that I will let you know. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you to everybody who wrote in when we put out the call to um, send a message to the Prefet of Martinique. I think it really, really was helpful. Uh, all right, so um, interesting question from um, Dick Eels. He asked, what about publicizing the hunting among potential tourists to discourage them from visiting those islands? Did you catch that, Anthony? No. <laughs> okay. Um, he's asking, what about publishing the fact that there is hunting going on in Guadeloupe and Martinique to tourists mm -hmm. who presumably would be against the hunting to discourage them from visiting those islands? And then that bad publicity would in turn show the impact that tourism you know, has on the island and that you're scaring away the tourists because they don't want to visit an island where you're shooting birds. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can you can always try, but um, um, Guadeloupe and Martinique are not the, the destination number one for US, Canada, or, or whatever. See, it's most of them are French, so yeah, it won't it won't um, it won't um, make any any difference and. Mm -hmm. Especially because of this, the situation with the COVID, you know, um, it's almost impossible to travel actually, and um, just people from from France can come in Guadeloupe and Martinique actually. So, yeah, I'm not sure it will uh, change something. Right, and what we're hoping to do is to promote more bird tourism in these islands and also Barbados. So we have a Caribbean Birding Trail program where we promote bird tourism, visiting wetlands and seeing these incredible migrations of shorebirds and, and other birds. And if we can show the value of the habitat for tourists for bird watching versus hunting, you know, that could also, the, the economics of that could also argue in favor of um, more, hunt, you know, shorebird reserves or habitat reserves where there isn't hunting and people can go see the birds. And we'll be actually working on a project in that for that in Barbados this coming winter. Um, you know, putting up interpretive signs and birding trails and, and hopefully soon doing a guide training there um, because they're, the hunters there have um, been very cooperative and um, have set up a no shooting reserve. And, and so, you know, hopefully going in that direction will, will help a lot too in terms of saving the birds and saving the habitat and promoting that. Barbados is on the, is in the, on the good way <coughs> for, the, for shorebird protection. Mm -hmm. They stop uh, to shoot in many uh, shooting swamps, yeah. and uh, I think it's almost only five or six compared to the the ten or twelve in the past. Uh, in the past, it was like fifteen or twenty years ago only. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, they've made a lot of good progress, mm -hmm. definitely. We need to send the Barbados hunters over to Guadalupe and Martinique to have a chat and and say, um, hey, you know, let's let's talk and and make this make this work. Alex, do you have anything else to add about the situation in Barbados? Uh, only what has already been said that like there's less and less hunting. I think in Barbados the situation is also that it's older people who hunt, so it's not being passed on to the younger generation there. They're not as interested in hunting. So as the hunters get older, there's less and less hunting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I guess the issue in Barbados is gonna to start to be what happens to the wetlands when people don't hunt there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, right. Because as you said, you often need the hunters to be maintaining these wetlands to provide places for shorebirds. Exactly. And if they're not gonna hunt, what's gonna to happen to the wetland? Right, they might be turned over to agriculture or other kind of development. So it's very important to keep an eye on that and make sure that those habitats are saved. Um, if the hunters are not going to manage them anymore, and they do do need management. So uh, we have another question um, asking: Are there awareness programs going on in the Caribbean for the general public and in schools against hunting? Anthony, can you talk a little bit about your? work with school kids or visiting schools. Um, I know we've done the, we have an activity in our workbook, Wondrous West Indian Wetlands, which is an essay about a, a teenage son who gets a gun for his 16th birthday. And, you know, he's been out birding and now he has to decide, do I shoot the birds or do I just continue to um, hunt, yeah. be a hunter like my dad and my, and uh, my grandpa. Yeah. It, it, it's not it's not it's not easy um, with the kids because um, I met some um, how to say some uh, I test the the kids at school um, with the twenty common commonest species of Guadeloupe like the the brown pelican the Guadeloupe woodpecker the banana quit etc and on twenty <clears throat> the 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 average uh, is um, between three and four good answers hmm. so they don't know the birds and hmm. the best best kids are the the, the kids of the hunters in general <laughs> to yeah. recognize the species so that is it yeah. but we are we are a uh, thanks to to the to the money from from us and from and locally from guadeloupe um, we are going at school as often as possible and making um, a training session for um, for the biologist uh, teachers and uh, so we will you know try to make uh, things better in the future this is um, a long and harassing job but um, yeah we are motivated, motivated. That's great yeah yeah, and we we very strongly believe in just um, education about birds and nature and and enjoying being outside and and birding and learning we are about posters biology. and leaflets and um, organizing the international migratory bird day every year with uh, with uh, you at Birds Caribbean. So mm -hmm. yeah, we are we are trying to to make more, uh, you know, public education and especially at school because yeah, kids are very important, but um, you know, in French, like in probably in US or everywhere in the Caribbean, many, most of the kids are more interested in with their smartphones than going outside. So this yeah. is the really the problem. Yeah. Got to try to catch them young, get them hooked. Mm. Um, all right, another question from Arnie um, Lesterhouse. He is asking, are there partners in Suriname carrying out surveys of yellow legs currently? I'm guessing yes. Um, I know, I don't know for sure though. Jim, do you know? Uh, no, I, I'm not aware of, of any survey programs in, in Suriname. Okay. I know that David Mizrahi is, is there working on, I believe, um, sandpipers, but I don't know if he's working also on yellow legs. We'll have to find out about that. Um, all right, we'll do a couple more questions and then sign off. Thank you for all your great questions. Um, Terry Root is asking, with the drying up of wetlands due to climate change, 
possibly be seen in lower body weight or a longer time needed to get body fat up high enough to migrate. That's a great question. Um, a lot of what we're focused on in Alaska and the breeding grounds is, is trying to look at limiting factors and um, habitat use, including the drying of wetlands is, is certainly a consideration. We, we unfortunately don't have, you know, the answers for, you know, broad scale effects of wetland drying on, on body condition uh, of, of lesser yellow legs, but, you know, we're, we're just, we're just getting started. Um, really, you know, we've, the project that, that, that Laura described was initiated just a couple of years ago, and, um, there's still so much to be done. One of the, one of the things that we're really trying to focus on now is, is estimating vital rates, uh, including adult survival and reproductive rates, just to, to again, get a better sense of, of what the limiting factors are when, when the population is being regulated. And uh, not, you know, harvest of lesser eggs is clearly an important factor, but there's, there are many other threats that I think are impacting this species. And it's important if we're gonna stop the decline and recover the population that we're aware of as many of them as, as possible. And if, if, if you wouldn't mind, um, I'll just take another minute to mention some, some good news. Um, recently, we, we um, were invited to submit a proposal to the Knobloch Family Foundation. And I'm, I'm not aware of if, if that foundation is involved in the Caribbean, but it's certainly becoming more and more involved in North America and, and in many cases focused on shorebird conservation issues. And we, uh, we received just a couple of days ago um, the good news that Knobloch will fund um, a number of initial steps towards the recovery of lesser, lesser yell legs. And, and one of those steps is to develop uh, a working group uh, to facilitate communication and engage with partners like many of you on this webinar. And so if Lisa, there's some way for you to share my contact information with, with folks who might be interested in participating in that working group, that'd be great. We're just sort of getting up to speed and we're hoping to hire a part-time coordinator um, just to ensure that we have continuity and communication and we can all more effectively work together uh, towards solutions. And um, so yeah, some good news. And, and you know, I just, if, another minute, I'm, I'm hogging the stage here, but um, I first met Anthony in 2011 at a conference in Vancouver, Canada, where he came to talk about shorebird hunting. And, and at that time, that was an issue that uh, was unknown to many North American shorebird biologists. And I think it shocked a lot of people, um, the magnitude and, and effects of, of sherbet harvest. And since then, it's just been amazing and inspiring to see the progress and success that Anthony and his partners um, have, have had in this region. So you now keep up the great work and you know, just really appreciate everything that you're doing. Thanks, Jim. Those are excellent closing remarks, I think, for sure, because these birds migrate across so many borders and boundaries and geographic regions, we all need to communicate and work together. And so it's fantastic news about this funding. And um, we'll definitely keep in touch with you and make sure that we're all communicating and working together and, and to, to solve all the different facets of this um, issue of why the species is declining and, and work on it together. So um, thank you again, everybody for joining us. And um, we will have this webinar available also on our YouTube channel um, by next week. And um, any other questions, just get in touch with us. Um, let's see, maybe Jim, you could put your um, email address in the chat window, if you don't mind. That would be a good way for people to get in touch with you. And thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll do so that right now. Thank you. Great. Yeah. And thank you so much to um, 
all of our panelists and also Adrian our Tosses, our president, who's been doing closed caption translation for us. And thank you to Environment for the Americas for co-hosting this webinar for us as well. Um, happy World Migratory Bird Day and um, hope you all can get out this weekend and find some shorebirds, maybe some yellow legs even. And um, enjoy your, your outing and thanks again for joining us. Bye for now.